This is our first public event in our theater space since January of 2020. So thank you all for coming out and supporting us again. Also, it's really great that you are here to bear witness to an evening of glorious conversation between some of the brightest minds to ever bless the profession of librarianship. Tonight's event was coined as the Super Bowl of librarians by one of our staff members. But as we planned this event for almost a year, um, that nickname just stuck. Um, but I wanna just say and be clear about this. These women are not in competition with each other. They are at the top of their careers. And the, the difference is, is that they are on the front lines engaged in righteous battle alongside each other, fighting for the fate of our collective intellectual freedoms. And so for that, we are very proud and thankful for that they saw fit to come here to share their thoughts and ideas with you. Um, this special cultural conversation is part of our 20th anniversary programming, recognizing black excellence in its many forms. Many of you represent that same thing. And I thank you for the work that you are doing in this community here. Cultural conversation started in 2019 with the goal to engage the community through intellectually stimulating discussions um, that inspire curiosity and illuminates and celebrates known and unknown history within the black diaspora. Joining us in making this cultural conversations possible, I want to acknowledge Nova Southern, excuse me, Nova Southeastern University's Alvin Sherman Library and its di director, Jim Hutchins and his staff. Thank you, Jim, for supporting tonight. <laughs> BBX Capital Foundation, thank you for your support. Ryder, EBSCO, Dickey Consulting with its founder, Cheryl Dickey, thank you so much. Much gratitude to Broward Public Library Foundation's President Dor Dorothy Klein and Director of Philanthropy, Robert Allness. Thank you so much for rallying behind this vision and helping us to make it a success by bringing um, our valued community sponsors to the table. I also want to acknowledge Arlick's founder, Sam Morrison, who's in the audience. Thank you for the vision, making it plain to allow us to be here today. And so now I want to move on and bring to the stage Arlick's assistant manager, Sheena Suell, to introduce tonight's honored guest. Yay, Sheena! Good evening, everyone. I am Sheena Sewell. I am the community library manager senior here at the African American Research Library and Cultural Center. I have the honor of introducing these heroes of black women librarians here i just i side note i was just telling dr cook like i've been to webinars and trainings and she's a teacher and to actually meet her in person it's uh yeah so dr meredith evans is the director of the jimmy carter presidential library and museum administered by the u.s national archives and records administration she was the university librarian at both Washington University in St. Louis and University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Dr. Evans has written on the role and value of libraries and archives as advocacy organizations that support and document social change. Dr. Evans earned a Master of Library Science from Clark Atlanta University, Master's degree in Public History at North Carolina State University, and her doctorate in Library Science from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She deeply believes in supporting community collaborations to increase the number of collections that serve as evidence for, for, written, for written history. Dr. Nicole Cook is the Augusta Baker Endowed Chair and Associate Professor at the School of Library and Information Science at the University of South Carolina. Dr. Cook was named a mover and shaker by Library Journal in 2007, awarded the 2016 ALA Equality Award, and she was presented with the 2017 ALA Achievement in Library Diversity Research Honor. In 2021, she was presented with the Martin Luther King Jr. Social Justice Award by the University of South Carolina. Dr. Cook has published numerous articles and book chapters. Her latest books are Information Service to Diverse Populations and Fake News and Alternative Facts, Information Literacy in a Post-Truth Era. Dr. Cook's research and teaching interests include human information behavior, fake news consumption, and resistance 
critical cultural information studies and diversity and social justice in librarianship. Dr. Sophia Noble is a 2021 MacArthur Fellow and author of the highly acclaimed Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. She is an Associate Professor of Gender Studies and African American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles where she serves as the co-founder and director of the UCLA Center for Critical in Internet Inquiry. She and her work have been featured in Time Magazine, The Guardian, BBC, CNN International, Wired, The New York Times, among many others. Her talks and research focus on the ways that digital media impacts our lives and intersects with issues of race, gender, culture, and technology. Thank you, ladies. We are missing one person, which is Miss Tracy Hall. Tracy Hall is the executive director of the American Library Association. She unfortunately was not able to be with us at this time. However, she did send a message for us to play for you tonight. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tracy Hall executive director of the American Library Association. And I am so excited to greet you at the beginning of this timely program, exploring the role of black women and their impact in libraries and on the field of librarianship. When I think about my own positionality, being the first black woman to helm ALA and with my own background in public libraries, I think about the shoulders of the women I stand on, many of them first in the field. I'm talking about Miriam Matthews, the first credentialed black librarian to be hired at the Los Angeles Public Library, the city in which I was born. Catherine Allen Latimer, the first black librarian at New York Public Library, a city in which I've worked. And Vivian Gordon Harsh, the first black librarian to be hired at the Chicago Public Library, the city in which ALA is headquartered. I'm also talking about Dr. Carla Hayton, a personal mentor and one of our nation's greatest living LIS practitioners, who upon her appointment in 2016 by President Barack Obama became the 14th Librarian of Congress and the first Black woman to hold that office. Even today, in the 21st century, Black women are still breaking down barriers. And there is more work to do especially in times like these, when books that contain our voices, ideas, and lived experience are sometimes seen as contraband and faced with censorship. It is so important that we as a community of Black women and as a community that supports and uplifts Black women along with everyone else, it's important that we stand on the principles of intellectual freedom, access, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social responsibility, all of them core values for the more than 50,000 individuals who join together as members of the American Library Association. With book censorship today now surpassing that of the McCarthy era, preserving access to literacy, libraries, and the right to read freely is the work. And though I long to be with you in person, I will allow these timely words from our late great sister librarian and activist Audre Lorde to hold my space. Lord writes, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. So enjoy this convening and the communion it offers. May you emerge even more connected and even more empowered. So as Tracy said, she longed to be with us tonight, but one of the things, if you are friends or know anything about Tracy, she always seems to bring sort of a, like a prophetic word. She always brings really good knowledge. And so it's wonderful to be a part of a professional organization which she is now the executive director. And so um, I wanna start with some of the things that she actually talked about. Um, but before I do that, welcome. Thank you so very much for being here again. 
And so this year's, we're wrapping up National Library Week, right? And so the, the theme for this year is connect with your library. And I'm happy that the African American Research Library and Cultural Center serves as a space to connect us all together um, for this historic conversation for the first time. So thank you again. And so one of the things that Tracy um, does in this message is she starts to call forth our library lineage um, in terms of the, the black women that connect us. And so um, just to sort of start off this conversation in the fashion of say her name, mm -hmm. um, I want us to honor some of the, the women who paved the way or the legacy um, that you all operate in that inspired the work that you do today. So just jump in and say the names of the women that are important to you in your work. So many. Mm -hmm. um, Lorraine Brown, she taught us cataloging at the library school at Clark Atlanta. She was a force to be reckoned with. Uh, Virginia Lacey Jones, I never got the pleasure of meeting, but that was she was part of my alma mater as mm -hmm. well. Um, Will DeLogan, who introduced me to the National Archives. Um, Karen Jefferson, who introduced me more to special collections and the richness of historically black colleges. Um, in a new way, Makiba Foster, mm -hmm. who supported me and watched you together, we grew. So I could go on, I could go on. My mother, she's in yes. the audience. How yes. could you not give a shout out to <laughs> the one who birthed you, right? Yes. So, yes. Thank you. So I have to start out with Augusta Baker, legendary black children's librarian from New York Public uh, for the job that I'm in is named after her. Um, and I have to say, you know, just as a, a side note, I didn't learn about Augusta Baker uh, in library school. So, you know, I think we need to uh, be doing more to learn about these names. And along those same lines, Charlamagne Rollins uh, and all of the, really the social justice advocates that were doing this work decades ago, we are certainly standing on their shoulders. Uh, Mrs. Thelma Tate, who was the first black librarian that I ever saw in college um, at Rutgers University. Uh, and she would bring me uh, tapes, audio tapes of conference recordings from IFLA, of all things. And, you know, I'm, I'm 21, I had no idea what she's talking about. Um, but I, I remember her fondly and remember her telling me that you could do this. So, um, like Meredith said, there are so many. Um, and I'll acknowledge my mom as well. Um, I remember her saying, you know, when I received my PhD, she said to the dean of my college, where's my diploma? <laughs> she said, I earned this with her. Um, so certainly, you know, shout out to her as well. Um, and I have to, you know, just also say that in this week where um, Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown Jackson was confirmed, um, she is certainly um, a role model, I think, for all of us and reminds us what faith and perseverance look like. So shout out to her as well, because Absolutely. faith and perseverance are certainly things that we all know about as well. Absolutely. Thank you. This is a confronting question because I didn't have any exposure to any Black librarians in any of my formative years when I was an undergraduate, even when I was in library school, uh, not a single black woman professor. So uh, I have to think about the black feminists though, who were my educators and who encouraged me to read and to care about the things that I've come to write about. And those certainly are my, my aunt Daris Burks, who was the first black woman I knew who was a computer scientist mm -hmm. when I was a child. Um, in the 70s and 80s, she was already doing computer science. And uh, certainly Dr. Sharon Elise, who was a very important uh, gender studies um, and African-American studies professor for me at Fresno State. Dr. Sharon Tedega, when I was at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, she now is the director of the Black Studies Research Center at UC Santa Barbara and was the person who really pulled me and has held me up my whole career and really pulled me through. And I realized that um, all of us are rooted in this love for learning and learning about ourselves, and that that is actually the most powerful contribution that 
Black librarians, Black feminists, um, Black educators do for us, and certainly did for me. So I'm 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 confronted that here in 2022, I don't have a single Black librarian in my life personally that touched me as in my formative years. And I think that really speaks to the importance of this event that we're having now that we think of so much progress, but there's still so much work to do. To do. Thank you. So I, I won't insert myself much into this conversation because I want to hear from you, all, but I also have to, to pay homage to the women who came before me. So I want to honor authoring Lucy Foster, no relation, who was the first African American admitted to the University of Alabama, which is my alma mater, um, who at that time suffered from white terrorism um, because of her enrollment, um, but she was enrolling um, for a, a undergraduate degree in library science, which I'm a, a graduate of that particular program. So on her shoulders, I stand. Um, Miss Julie Hunter, who is in the audience, thank you for the work that you have done to pave the way building black collections. Um, Virginia Tolliver, who was the first black administrator that I saw, black woman administrator in libraries that I had the privilege to work with. Um, so many more. Mary Lou Bonner, who is local to here. Miss Barner was the first black woman um, librarian here in Broward County. So I just want to pay respect and, and say their name. So I'll move on to some questions now. <laughs> um, so thinking about that, that idea of connect with your library, I want to sort of remix that idea of not just thinking about libraries in the, the, the as the physical space but also our our black library and foremothers and, and thinking about um, particularly your current work and how it's being used to create a, a sort of better world for marginalized women and girls so um, can you please share a bit more about your work and what motivates that work in libraries archives and information education and technology and how that world creates a better world for marginalized women and girls and thereby everyone. So anybody can just jump in. <laughs> okay, so I'll jump in. Um, I've worked a lot of places, um, but my goal is always to what I call diversify collections. So I've worked in a lot of repositories and I am an archivist by trade because I believe in documenting people's experience through paper records, audio records, film records, regard, digital records, regardless of the format, but that it should be somewhere that it's accessible 50 years from now, 100 years from now, so people know that you exist. So um, my goal is always to make sure that you can be seen in a collection, regardless of whether it's a person, because where I work now, it's surrounded, it's a federal facility, it's federal records surrounding a president. But I've worked in other repositories where there's always gaps. They're either always donor driven and so people get left out and the community doesn't see themselves. And so particularly for women, it's very important that we um, include description that you can identify the women um, in these collections. Um, it's very important that if you don't see women or people of color in the collection that you figure out a way to get some more materials to supplement. Um, there's lots of examples of this. You know, people will have a collection on Western, you know, Western cowboys and there'll be women in those papers, but you wouldn't know that because it says Western cowboys, but there were women there. There were women cowboys, <laughs> cowgirls, and there were women who supported the cooking and supported the direction in which they went and things like that. And so description matters. And so for me, it's looking at where I am and looking at the collections and how can I highlight um, the people of color and the women who are there. And if we don't have anything, let's, let's go find it. Yeah. We can clap for that. <laughs> so I always say that my goal is to leave librarianship a better place than when I found it. Um, not that I found it, you know, I just want to make it better. Um, but with that said, I think that there is still a lot of work that we need to do as a profession. We are a profession that is depends on where you're looking. 82% uh, between 82% 85% white female. Uh, so for those of us on the stage, uh, the wonderful folks that work here at Arlick, um, we are literally uh, in the minority in our own profession. And so I was having 
um, a conversation with Lisa earlier today, and I was reminded that when I worked as an academic librarian in New Jersey, uh, and then I went to get my PhD, and then I was became a faculty member, started at the University of Illinois before I went to the University of South Carolina. And just like Dr. Noble mentioned, not ever having you know, a black librarian to speak of, um, I think a lot of us never had black teachers. I didn't. Now, I grew up in New Jersey, which is one of the most diverse places, and I still didn't have a black teacher. Um, I didn't have a black teacher until I was an undergrad. And so when I got to the University of Illinois um, and I was teaching in the Graduate Library and Information Science program, I still had a lot of students say, you are the first person of color I have ever seen in the front of a classroom. Right, this is 2012, this is, you know. Um, and for most people, that was a great thing. It was an opportunity to learn, but there were some folks that were not really uh, enamored with this idea that I was the authority in something and that I had control of their grades and that I was the expert in the room. And so they challenged me and we had a, you know, there I can just still think of at least three, uh, that we had a little tussle, I won. Um, <laughs> Um, but they were just, you know, they were so uncomfortable, you know, and they weren't really, they weren't willing to sit in that discomfort and think about why is this really an issue? Why do you have a problem working, or excuse me, working with and learning from a Black woman? And so I had always done equity work, diversity work as my service work as a professional librarian. But with what I just described, that's how it became formalized as a field of research for me, as a way to um, do writing and, and create classes in this area. And then even with that said, there were still and still are professionals in our field that said to me, well, you don't think you're getting tenure on that stuff. You know, equity and diversity is that stuff. Uh, I did. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, we, we, there's, there's just so many layers uh, to all of this. And so, Makiva, to your question, um, I have written several articles uh, that call people out and call institutions out. Um, and I have had uh, young Black aspiring library professionals come up to me at conferences, and they don't whisper anymore, but when this first started happening, they would whisper and say, I have your article in my desk drawer. Right, and they would say, this is the first time that I ever saw myself in the library literature. So for me, uh, you know, I really work a little bit more with the library profession to diversify that profession, to make sure that we have a voice and continue to have a voice in this profession. And I think all of us are still working towards this idea that we will have a critical mass of people of color in the profession. Um, and so, and then also I want to prepare people to work in the community and be able to serve communities equitably and enthusiastically, right? I don't want people to go to various, you know, library systems and say, I don't wanna work with those people. That is not acceptable. Um, and so, you know, libraries are a microcosm of the, the world that we live in, and we all need to be prepared to do that. So I think that is the angle at which um, I'm working with the marginalized and helping people, uh, hopefully, to see themselves uh, in this profession, to recognize this profession as something uh, that they would enjoy, that they'll love, that they'll thrive in, and then be able to, you know, then share that love uh, with the community. I really appreciate, yes, this conversation and the question, because when I started library school, it was after a 15 year career in advertising and marketing, multicultural marketing in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. And I had spent my whole career before going to library school um, selling products and services to, so I'm, I apologize now for the hummers and the booze and all the things, but uh, <laughs> I, I was there. Um, and all of those experiences really helped me understand that many major corporations are um, in charge of funding so many dimensions of culture making, 
especially for black people and especially in urban um, cities where I lived like Oakland. And as I was, um, as the recession was coming, it was a great time to go back to graduate school. I went to library school, um, not to become a librarian, but be because I was concerned with the future of knowledge. And I was thinking about how much corporations were really shaping our access to knowledge about ourselves. And um, something was wrong with that. So I often tell my students I went back to graduate school to atone for my sins. <laughs> and I stand by that. And one of the things that was happening in 2008, 9, 10 was the ascent of Google. Now, um, at the time that I was in library school, people were talking about Google like it was the new online public library. Those were the phrases. I just met a person a few day days ago who said, I thought Google was a nonprofit. Still did not, still there are still people out here in the world who think that Google is like a public good. And uh, I was so struck by that because I just left the advertising industry and I absolutely understood Google and other kinds of search technologies as advertising technologies. I mean, it was just grounded in that. Um, this is the early days of search engine optimization. Um, now it's a full-blown industry, but these were the early days of that. And um, at that time, there was also this massive Google book digitization project where Google was going in and scanning millions of volumes all over the United States, academic libraries all over Europe, um, with this idea that it was going to um, organize all the world's knowledge, which just happened to be English speaking, French, and Spanish speaking knowledge. And of course, we already know where we're not represented in that. And so these were the tensions that were um, present for me when I started my research. And I thought, I've got to find a way to convey to the public that relying upon major corporations like this, especially advertising companies, to reflect back to us the alleged truth of who we are as they were coming to start displacing uh, libraries, librarians, professors, teachers, parents, as the legitimate kind of authoritative knowledge source, um, that seemed to me to, uh, an incredibly dangerous proposition. And it seemed like no one was kind of critically engaging with that conversation. And so I started my work, my first study, uh, in, in my dissertation that eventually became morphed into something very different, the book Algorithms of Oppression, it started with a very simple keyword search on black girls. And I looked to see, so now you know you're everywhere now and you know this already that when, you know, for many years, for a decade, when you did the keyword search on black girls, the primary uh, search results that came back on the first page were almost exclusively pornography or this kind of hypersexualized content. Um, I meet people all the time now who are in uh, like airports or at the you know beauty shop and they're like, oh yeah, girl, you know, when you search for black girls, you know, you get that porn. And I'm like, I do know, I do know. I actually, I actually help us know that. So um, I started publishing studies about this in 2012. Uh, 2009 is when I started this work. And I systematically collected searches on black girls, women, women of color, many different identities, and then started to demonstrate and contextualize how these misrepresentations of black women, of black people, of people of color in the United States are so profoundly tied to narratives that are about what Patricia Hill Collins calls controlling narratives, right? And these controlling images about us that are used in service of our oppression. They're used to um, delegitimize us, to disqualify us, to narrate us as subhuman or um, incapable. And of course, one of the things we need to know is that this, this idea, this stereotype of the hypersexualized black woman or girl child comes into existence at the time that the transatlantic slave trade is outlawed and the only way that you can re reproduce the enslaved labor force is through um, forced reproduction or through reproduction 
And so a stereotype has to emerge that black women, all we want to do is have sex, that black girl children, all they want to do is have sex, right? So this narrative is used in service of keeping um, control over black women's bodies and black families. And um, I made those linkages between what you get in a Google search to these long histories that predate the internet. And I feel like that has been my contribution is to argue that the algorithms and the AI that are driving many of these systems are really imbued with so much racist ideology and sexist ideas. And in 2012, when I was trying to, you know, finish my dissertation and get four people to be on a dissertation committee to approve my work, it was very dangerous for professors to put their names on the line uh, for this black woman who was arguing that algorithms could be racist. You have to remember, no one was saying that a decade ago. Now this is in the headline every every day, every week. There's some new, I mean, we're in Broward County. Obviously, you know better than most about Compass and the recidivism prediction software that was you know, used here and that was proven to be racially discriminatory. Um, it's the one of the most iconic cases of racial discrimination baked into software um, that we talk about. But 10 years ago, when you talked about technology as a, um, a value system of power that uh, had serious consequences in our lives, most people would respond and say, that's just impossible because algorithms are math and math can't be racist or sexist. And so, of course, this is like saying to the biologist, what is it to be human? And then responding with, well, to be human is to be cells in mitochondria. And yes, that's true, but that's not quite the whole story. And so um, this has been my contribution truly, I think, is to challenge these ideas of kind of the technical infrastructures of knowledge that undergird the incredible work that these two women are doing and so many others, um, and to teach our students to think critically, especially librarians who really have been at the forefront of embracing a lot of technology uncritically without a good power analysis about what's, what the stakes are of that, and who have not necessarily resisted the Googleization of the library and are being forced by a variety of different stakeholders to embrace these technologies um, that also come to displace this very, very important expertise that the two of you are talking about that we need to discern what's really at stake and what's really happening rather than naturalizing um, you know, racism and sexism. And so um, this is the work that I do in the world and this is the contribution that I'm trying to make and I see it coming, I mean, I'm so grateful that it comes and is connected to this tradition of librarianship, because if I hadn't been asking the questions about the future of knowledge for black people, I might not have really stumbled into this area. And now, of course, we have a whole field and thousands of people who are looking at these issues. Can I, can I just jump in real quick? <clears throat> This is a conversation, yeah. so please. What's so fascinating about it is because I, I really work hard to change that historic narrative in the past, right? Because part of the stereotypes and things that you're talking about is because it's historic. If there was no black woman leader or corporate person in an archive in those business records, you would not think that that's something that's possible to do or that she would do. So we are still the sort of mammies, we're still the Jezebels in those that historic narrative because no one has sought collections mm -hmm. to contradict that. So that's the what this being in this place, that's why this place exists. Broward, this library exists so that there is another narrative of African American people, particularly women, that people don't see. They don't see it on the web, they don't see it in the history, in the past, because when people did their research and wrote their books, we weren't there. Mm. But we are. So how do we make sure that more collections are included? And how do we make sure that we highlight those collections so that the past that was written that's wrong <laughs> or not inclusive is corrected? And that, you know, that would make your work so much different if we had done this. 100 years ago possibly it's so true. right yes because one of the things that people fail to realize often is that part of the 
reasons we have discrimination in artificial intelligence and machine learning systems is because they are trained on data, archival data many times. They're, they're trained on data sets. So librarians are so important. They're really the original data scientists. I mean, this is a whole new field that's emerging, but this idea of um, labeling data, making it make sense, contextualizing it, this is the part that has truly been stripped out of the contemporary information landscape or data scientists are not trained in librarianship. They don't have that kind of discernment and that eye about power, the nuances, the subjectivities. In fact, they're trained to flatten those things and report them out as not subjective, right? As just just it's just data data is probably one of the most dangerous words in our society right now because what it does is it obfuscates this incredibly important uh, legacy of discrimination and it's how we can have um, algorithms and ai that are trained on historical data and then we have these really horrible disparate outcomes and we don't understand why and so I think, you know, I always have said that librarians are um, have to be the heart and the leadership of the future of thinking about knowledge and information and technology, because we incorporate and understand these things, whereas I think other fields are completely disinterested with these kinds of um, important historical facts. And I think as part of the leadership that Dr. Noble mentions, is that we have to continue to communicate with our communities and with our friends and with our circles about this information, right? So I think that, you know, that's part of the reason that the three of us do what we do and why we're always out and about is because what's the point of this research and this important work if we're not sharing it, right? So Dr. Noble mentioned, you know, the, the, the ladies in the hair salon saying, oh, girl, did you know? Um, yeah, they know, but they don't, everyone does still doesn't know right and i always say i'm going to spend the rest of my career um you know doing the same workshop um in the same training because there's always someone new to tell to share this information with and i you know part of the work with the students is you know god love them um they they don't think that they have to do any public speaking they don't think that they have to do um you know they do outreach but they don't want they don't see themselves as teachers Right. And I think, you know, I, I try to tell them you are teachers, even if you're just talking to one person, because it's you sharing this information that is going to help us do better. If we don't have these conversations, we're not going to be able to move the needle. Right. I think it was Amazon. Uh, there was another AI story not too long ago about how they're hiring. And they found out that the bot is racist or sexist in this sense because it was automatically knocking out female candidates. And they said, no, that can't be. Of course it is, because just like Dr. Noble said, the AI, the algorithm was trained on their last 10 years of data and who works at Amazon? White men. Yeah, right. they actually found in that study that um, not only that, but that the model, uh, like the, because you, one of the things you wanna remember in this kind of statistical modeling is they're looking for, it's a bell curve and you're, they're trying to figure out what's the ideal mm -hmm. person, right? So it turns out that the ideal person, and this is, this, this matters for us because think of all the patrons who come into the library to use computers to try to find jobs. And they're trying to submit resumes and they're uploading them to software screener systems, all right? Every company you have to upload and it's looking, it's scanning your resume like that Amazon AI for certain keywords. And if those keywords are not present, you're out, yeah. all right? And so when they figured out what the ideal kind of model person was um, to get jobs that but using these HR screeners, it was a guy named Chad who plays lacrosse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, oops, we're, mm -hmm. we're in trouble. Um, it's like, you know, whoopee, Molly, you in trouble, girl, you know, <laughs> you in danger, girl. So um, I, I feel like these are the things that are just so incredibly important. And we're incorporating those kinds of systems and logics, quite frankly, into our own discovery systems. I mean, this is a place where we're also trying to figure out if the whole world is being socialized to 
um, using computing and cert using keywords and getting like as and if you look at the information retrieval research, you know that people search on very few keywords. So if you, people are using just a few keywords out there outside the library or inside the library on Google or other kinds of search engines, then they're expecting to be able to use those same kinds of search behaviors in the library systems. Well, we know that our systems don't quite work that way. So we have these other kinds of acculturation barriers to knowledge, like a, you know, um, uh, a reduction in sophistication and, and a reduction in curiosity too, because, you know, I know, I know, I know how old most of us on this um, stage are, Hush. and I'm just gonna guess <laughs> that we didn't use library databases. We used card catalogs <laughs> when we were back in the days. A lot of hair dye up here, y'all. And uh, we also walked the stacks, and we discovered things. And you know, one of the th we still have challenges, even in these areas. You know, I ask my LGBTQI plus students um, uh, who are saying, Dr. Noble, you know, I want to work on an assignment. I, you know, I really want to understand the library better. And I said, go to the library, use a database, look for an item that you think is interesting to you, and then go walk the stacks and find it. And, you know, their relationship between finding that item in a database, um, and of course, we should question how did the, what, how did the first result become the first result? But that's a whole another lecture for a whole another day. But you know, in this database logic, hierarchical um, listing, they find their item and then they go walk the stacks and they find that the book about their own identities is cataloged on the shelf with like you know deviants and um, you know. Uh, um, mental framed as like mental, mental illness, illness. Yeah. you know, it's like a, like a DSM type yeah. of, you know, problem. So there are also problems, you know, I don't want to just blame it all on Google, but you know that I love to blame it all on Google all the time. I mean, if that's what I do. Um, but I also know that we have a lot to learn about inclusion still in our own organization practices yes. and our own accessibility practices. Well, that's what's also exciting about community archiving, because as a community, we tend not to collect, we tend not to keep, it's not important. And I spend more time convincing people of color and women that they are important and that whatever documentation they have is important. I spend hours doing this weekly because people think no one wants to read that 100 years from now, 50 mm -hmm. years from now. And I'm like, yes, they do. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of being a first. I don't know about anybody else. I'm tired of being the first yep. black woman to do this, the first black to do that. I'm tired of that. I want others to do it, but I also want to see us in the record. And if I can't get the community to know that they're important and everything you do is important, that church is important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Even if it's not as well, you know, upstanding as it once was, or it doesn't have the biggest congregation, it doesn't matter. Those are the people that serve the community. They feed the homeless, they take care of the babies. You know, there's executives with nurses, with teachers in the same building, if that's the community. Mm -hmm. But if the church doesn't keep those records, you'll never know that. Mm -hmm. And if the people don't give to that church, and say, oh, I, you know, I was deaconess, or yes, I did teach Sunday school, and this is what I did. There's no record of that. And so when we get older and people write books on this and the African American church or the Broward County, there's no records from the people who actually did the work. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that lends yeah. itself to why would I want to be a librarian? Why would I want to be a church? Because I don't see us. And then you walk through, mm -hmm. you get to you, mm -hmm. and you, oh, I have a finally have a right. black teacher. Right. And then you get to you and go, Google finally recognizes me because they have umpteen publications. Yeah. Because yeah. she hates on Google, now all of a sudden she's Google Gable, <laughs> right? I, okay, it's not because she's fantastic <laughs> in her own right. It's because you hate on Google, right? And so, I mean, that's. You know, this is on the internet right, right? now. I do. I know. I know. I, but, you know, I, you know, I didn't even do my federal disclaimer. This is, these are my opinions, not that of the federal government. <laughs> I'm done. Well, but I will also, just to say to Mary this point, and we were talking about this earlier, on the flip side of that, there are some really fabulous and incredibly valuable collections that people don't know anything about. True. Right? So, and it's because the organization doesn't value them. Right? So it's one thing for the community to not value them, but it's also that the community may not know because organization doesn't value them. I have had 
so many experiences, another lecture, where I have been trying to get black archives about black librarians and black information professionals, and I can't get to them. I know they're there, but there are no finding aids. They are completely unprocessed. They're not preserved. Um, our history is literally dying in boxes, right? And so, you know, I think part of what I'm trying to do, and I know all of us are trying to do, is we're trying to also change things from the inside out. Right, so not only are we trying to change things, you know, in an external, uh, forward-facing way, there's a lot of in-house work that we're still trying to do because these houses are not in order. And you know, how are we expecting anyone else to value us if we don't value ourselves? So I want to. So you are in Florida, and so <laughs> back to Dr. Noble with we in trouble. <laughs> So some legislation is passed, um, particularly with school libraries, about providing a list of the content uh, that's in the library or books that have been challenged. Um, they need to be uh, sent up to Tallahassee for review. It's a lot of stuff that I think that if you're not paying attention, we are in trouble. And so talking about this idea of, of the actual historical record and not wanting to teach accurate history or more inclusive history, um, it is... It is quite scary. So I want to hear your thoughts, um, particularly with the current trends across the nation with the banning of books, policies, decisions, further marginalizing the LGBTQIA community, teaching of inclusive history and the fear of critical race theory, limiting access to the ballot box. We are in trouble. Dis and misinformation campaigns in the digital space in the digital space. Please share why libraries are critical in fighting these culture wars because i know sometimes i mean these librarians up here are amazing um and so if you didn't know librarians are amazing these are some <laughs> examples um but i think sometimes people don't think about some of these wars being fought actually in libraries but this is some of the work that we do mm -hmm. so if you all would share why like our work is critical to this this moment mm -hmm. i'll give meredith a break and i'll start <laughs> um misinformation and disinformation fake news is kind of my thing um but i will say and i'll tell you just very quickly how i kind of got into it so as librarians we particularly those of us who taught um i used to work in an academic library i did lots of information literacy sessions so librarians have been doing information literacy for decades and we were teaching people how to critically evaluate information so after a certain person won an election in 2016, um, suddenly- Voldemort. Voldemort, yes, thank you. <laughs> he who shall not be named. Um, all of a sudden people started screaming fake news. And I'm like, well, what, what? And a reporter called me and she said, oh my God, we're in such a big crisis now. How are libraries gonna help us uh, fight fake news? I had no idea what this little girl was, was asking me because I had not, my, I had not made the connection myself. Bless her for making the connection for me. And that's really how I kind of transitioned into the fake news. And I will tell you that PowerPoints that I used 20 years ago in a college classroom, I can still use now, right? And so now we're talking about how to combat misinformation and disinformation. It's the same skill set, just has a different name. And so when we started doing these workshops, I had students who took an information literacy instruction course from me and said, oh my God, Dr. Cook, how are we gonna combat fake news? We don't know how to do it. Of course you do, you just took the class. But I think part of it is we, we tend to compartmentalize in our thinking. And they hadn't yet made the connection between information literacy, misinformation and disinformation. And also I think more to Makiba's question is, you know, we were still trying to figure out our role in misinformation and disinformation. And therefore the community didn't necessarily look to us first um, as the experts in this domain. So we had to market ourselves a little differently and say, oh, come to this class on how to fight fake news. Same class we always taught, right? But if they hadn't come, they're not gonna know that. So we have to think a little bit differently and think about how we are meeting people where they are, or at better yet, we just go to them and tell and be proactive and say, hey, come on to this class so we can talk about these issues. Um, and I, you know, I say this all the time. I think that we have to be better uh, marketers of ourselves. And this is where 
Safia will come in. Um, and we have to be more proactive in, in selling ourselves because we are the experts. And instead of us waiting for folks to come into the building, not this building, because it's fabulous, um, but instead of waiting for people to come to us, we have to be more aggressive and say, you need to come to us and this is why. So I think it's it's a little bit of a two-way street, you know, in terms of you know, making that connection because people don't associate us with certain things. Um, we still deal with a lot of stereotypes. Um, you know, the stereotype threat that goes along with that. You know, we have, you know, none of us have a bun tonight. Several of us have glasses, no pearls, right? So there are very specific stereotypes about librarians and what librarians do. Uh, we've been fighting this for decades. Um, and I think we are, we are succeeding, uh, particularly by yes. having this panel of black women. Um, but you know, above and beyond that, we have to let people know that we are indeed the experts as well as keeping up on you know, the things that folks need to know. Yeah, I, would, I, I think it goes for all ages too. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, librarians, we have a social responsibility to help you evaluate a source, whatever that source is, and help you find the cues that you need to look for. And it starts really young. And it's frustrating for me to watch librarians Google. It drives me nuts because we know better. Um, but it's also when you look at the K through 12, where teachers are Googling, right, or there they're they're are no textbooks, so they're printing out things on the web, or they say, .edu and .org are the sources that you should use, that's not a thorough evaluation of a source. So we're already teaching our babies not the, the, not the best way to find and critically analyze what they're looking at. They're all looking at YouTube, they're all looking at Twitter, they're all just citing these .orgs or .edus and not really looking at what they're reading and what and how that impacts what they're writing. And so to me, it, we, we, all, we have to start somewhere. And I agree with the marketing, but now we're fighting getting people into the building. So then how do we do something on the web that helps people learn to evaluate the source, kind of identify what we're now calling fake news versus real news. But it's also about perspective. Some of these, you know, you can have the same story from a liberal stint to a conservative stint, but it's the same story. But if you're only reading one thing because of the <laughs> logarithms, right? You know, in AI, you're only reading what you're used to reading. You can't tell anything that's different at some point. And so we have a huge social responsibility to work with people, whether it's in person or digitally at any age, to really help them see how what sources are what and why we call things fake versus not fake um, and what, we, what you need to do with that information and why just reading 32 characters is not going to be enough. Reading the first paragraph of an article is not enough. You actually have to read the whole thing. <laughs> you know, things like this, because we're in the digital age, right? We'd rather watch a two-minute YouTube video to fix our window rather than read the 10-page manual. We're at that point in society. I'm not saying that YouTube video is fake news. I'm just saying, is that as thorough? I don't know. But you, you're choosing easy over a critical analysis. Um, and if we do that in every part of our life, our children do it. And if they do it, well, you check your wheels before you drive, because they might not have screwed on all the nuts. I, if I may just add to this just idea about our social responsibility. Um, and this is informed by the things that I get up every single day and work on, which is really the way in which so many different kinds of investments in technology and um, its role in collapsing democracy, in uh, contributing to the rise of authoritarian kind of right-wing governments around the world and in this country. Um, I think that is part of what's at stake when you ask the question about banned books, about banning critical race theory, uh, about banning um, saying that you're gay or coming out or being yourself. Uh, it's we witness the badgering and the normalization of trolling black women for sport on the internet, which is a very big business. These are the kinds of things that I study. And uh, to me, the stakes are great right now. We are moving into the next um, political cycle where 
we had something, I think last to count, um, more than 20 QAnon um, uh, conspiracy believers um, running for Congress. We have uh, very credible evidence that's coming out of the military right now that when the next presidential election takes place, there will be a coup d'etat attempted and um, they're worried because there were so many people at the January 6th um, storming of the Capitol who were in the military or militarily trained that they're actually not sure what that would mean if there were a coup d'etat. Um, for me, you know, I look at this and I see these are people tripling down on white supremacy, people who are committed to um, shrinking the sphere of um, humanity and possibility for poor people, for people of color, certainly for black people, um, and I, for women and our rights over our bodies. So this, when we think of it just like banned books, it's kind of like, oh, that's silly. Why would you not want to read like books by black people? But when you put it in political context and social context, then you actually see that it is death by a thousand cuts. It is a number of assaults and attacks and local policy, state policy, federal policy, um, uh, a wipeout, uh, making it illegal to talk about the history of racism, enslavement, mass incarceration, all of the things that critical race theorists, legal theorists help us understand. Um, so I think we are in a very informed position as librarians, especially as black librarians, radical librarians, people for whom the ability, I mean, we're sitting here talking about how we're still integrating the field right now. So I think we have got to take very seriously that librarianship has always been political. What a people can read, what a people can know, whether a people can and read whether a, pe a people will die for learning how to read or be murdered for trying to learn how to read that's actually our history in librarianship and that's why black histories of librarianship are so absolutely important because they're so present and necessary today the stakes are very high when I think about our kids not being able to learn about the history of racism or being taught that slavery was a choice. This is this is a way of um, really laying the seeds of propaganda to justify further genocide of our communities around the world, and I think this is. These are very real and very serious conversations that we have to take up and we have to press. Um, the thing that libraries have and that librarians have is the trust of people. I mean, who hates a librarian? <laughs> no one. What is wrong? You're just a terrible person if you don't like a librarian. So, you and know, we don't shush anymore. No, we right? don't. So, you know, we're no shushing and we got a computers um, with this beautiful, beautiful building. This is one of the most beautiful libraries I've been in. And, and I just want to say that it's um, it feels so beautiful for black people to have beautiful things mm -hmm. and so i just want to thank our ancestors and our legacy um our visionary here for blessing us with this so these are the things that i think are worth um putting into the mix of the conversations about banned books about uh hateful right-wing legislation mm -hmm. if you think it's not targeted for us you got another thing coming and when you think about the degree to which the investments in technology to make these types of investments more opaque and harder to understand and harder to apprehend and harder to wrap our arms around, we got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of work to do. And with just to piggyback on uh, the trust that Dr. Noble mentioned and everything that she so eloquently stated, when we tell you that libraries are not neutral, please believe us. You know, we're in National Library Week and it is 2022 and the librarians are still having debates about whether or not libraries are neutral. They are not. Yeah, they have to be liberatory. In fact, 
that's the stance. Yes. They're either working in service of our liberation or they are not. Right. That's the neutrality line. Right. So I, I for the sake of time, I'm not, I didn't wear a watch. What time is it? Don't let the watch. Okay. Anyways, so I since since Dr. Noble spoke of the legacy that we're in, I want to bring someone special to the stage, Miss Julie Hunter. So Miss Julie Hunter is the she was the inaugural director um, for not only the African American Research Library and Cultural Center, but also um, for the Auburn Avenue Research Library in Atlanta, um, which opened in 1994. So that's why I honor her as a collection builder. And so I had the distinct privilege to write a blog post for um, Dr. Cook's upcoming publication, um, uh, two part. One is the published work and then the other is the blog. We did a blog on Miss Hunter and uh, she is a fascinating woman. Um, in her former life, she was a field secretary for the NACP and she worked alongside Megger Evers, um, and she was in Mississippi when the Tougaloo Nine integrated um, the, the reading room, the library in Jackson, Mississippi. And so when uh, they were deliberating that case, she was with um, uh, Mr. Evers. And so she was a part of that party where the, the police sick dogs on them. So I learned so much about Ms. Julie writing this article, and it is such an honor that I am within her legacy. Um, get the microphone right there, Ms. Julie. And so, uh, so very happy. This past Tuesday, she celebrated her 85th birthday. <laughs> so Sheena has some flowers for you. We're giving her her flowers now. <laughs> I am sitting here enjoying this discussion. Now you're part of it. Because what you don't realize that how important information is in your lives. If you don't know what's around you, you don't, where are you gonna get it from? These people are the people who organize that information. So all you need to do is to go to the library and get it. <laughs> this is exciting. I'm glad you find it exciting, Julie. We're very honored to have you here with us. Thank you. So anything you wanna to add to this conversation? The biggest thing is just to see so many people here and to know that libraries are really not well used. If we were to use libraries like we should, our communities would be much better off than they are today. It is something that children walking across the street with a phone in their hands what are they really looking at at that phone? What they need to do is to be in a library, finding the information that will support their daily lives so that they will be well prepared for this information technology that's been talked about. Libraries, I don't know how to tell you. When I was, where was I in, in, in Claflin College, you don't know where that is. It's in Orangeburg, South Carolina. <laughs> there was a, I was with a class teaching English as a second language. And I felt so ill-prepared at that time that I went to the library. So every day we had 30 minutes in the library and they became so fascinated with libraries, but they didn't realize that I was learning so much about the library, just having them there. And the librarian felt I needed to be a librarian. So she said to Dr. Virginia Lacey Jones, one of the pictures on there, who is the Dean of Deans across this country, I want you to meet Ms. Wright because that was my name at that time. I want her to be a librarian. And that's how I got to be a librarian. It has been the most fascinating profession that you could ever think about. And I surely am so pleased to hear all of this information that's been talked about today that we need to be so informed. That's what information does for us. It informs us, but you can't have it if you don't go get it. You got to really get it to strengthen your own knowledge about what life is around you. 
what cultures you are interacting with, how our information is identified, the terms are used to identify. And we would want to know how are we being identified in our cataloging of materials. So it is important to, that this discussion has taken place because now you understand that it is so important to have you here. I am so pleased yes, that this discussion I'm so happy that going you on. are pleased. I am. So look, Dr. Nicole, Thank you. Um, I don't know, I call you Dr. Nicole instead of Dr. Cook. Dr. Nicole, can you tell us a bit more about the, the project that I mentioned that Julie is featured in? Yes, so I am working on a project. It's already been maybe two or three years in the making on black women librarians, but that will be expanded soon. So I call it the Black Librarians Project. And so at the end of this month, there will be a special double issue of a journal called uh, Libraries, Culture, History and Society. It's a library history journal uh, and it will feature all uh, black women librarians. And so these are stories that I hadn't heard. Uh, these are, you know, we've heard of Dorothy Porter Wesley and, and Vivian Harsh, but I wanted to tell the stories of folks that don't get enough shine, if you will. And so with that um, special double issue, we have just as many uh, wonderful blog posts, and I think that they are just as stellar as the articles that are being published in the journal, just a little shorter. Um, we're working on an edited collection uh, with ALA so we can continue the, these stories. Uh, we're going to do Black Male Librarians next, so Mr. Mr. Sam, I'm coming for you next. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that there are just so many stories that we don't know. And I think it's, it's almost, you know, like when we say we need diverse books, um, we need uh, diverse library history. We need to know who came before us. Um, we need to know the legacies that are there because, you know, as I tell my students, black library history is library history. Um, there's so much that I think a lot of us didn't learn in our formal graduate programs. So I want to, you know, enable this information uh, to be available. Um, and just, you know, uh, Mr. Morrison uh, participated in my first foray into this idea of telling library history um, and have just been fascinated with it ever since, you know, because I didn't, you know, I, I feel like, especially as a, a young librarian, I didn't see myself in a lot of rooms. And then to see archives and to see newsletters with folks I didn't know who were black that looked like me, who are these people and why don't I know about them? Um, so that's really the impetus for this project. So we don't have to keep saying who is that and why don't we know um, because this is an exceptionally rich profession and even we don't know as a profession the folks who did so much work just listening to you know what miss julie was a part of and reading about what augusta baker did and and all of these amazing folks who really didn't get enough credit and i think they need to get their their flowers now thank you Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> no, I just think it's really fascinating the degrees of separation um, of us on this stage and how we're all interconnected. And so one of the things that I talked about in the in the writing, the the blog post about Miss Julie was this kind of idea of the, this network sisterhood. Um, so Julie telling the story about the black woman librarian at, at Claflin College who saw her work and and was a student of Virginia Lace Jones, saying, "Hey, I have." It's another student here. So how we support and lift each other, this whole idea of lifting as we climb. And so I, I'm very thankful that you all are, are we're connected in this way. And now we're even greater connected because of this form that we're in here. And thank you for bringing us together. Absolutely. <laughs> You're for being welcome. <laughs> for us to follow. So is there, uh, so guys, I'm gonna open it up for questions from the audience. So please start to make your way to the, to, to the podium microphones, excuse me, for your questions. But is there anything that you all want to share before we start taking some Q&A? I just want to encourage um, folks who are not Black librarians um, to continue to support us, to be allies, to really just be accomplices. Um, we need everyone involved in this work. Um, and, you know, do we, need, we have to continue doing this work even when it's not convenient, mm -hmm. um, because this is an ongoing 
yeah, struggle. Someone, I didn't want to say it, but someone said it. It's an ongoing struggle. So we, we need to uh, work collectively. So just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. I agree. I would say bring your nieces, nephews, and your babies to the library because we don't go anymore. And if you don't go and don't, if you don't bring them, they won't go and they won't know. Um, you know, when I was younger, you were talking about black teachers. I did have a black teacher, but I also, my mother was a teacher for a time. And I remember them, a group of parents, black women came together and showed us black art. They started a small library. That library is now a public library where I live. And, but that's because they valued the work of libraries. And if they hadn't done that, we wouldn't have known. And now there's an actual library where I grew up. So people can actually go there now. And I think about that. What if we never had a library? <laughs> what if they hadn't done that? I might not be in this profession because um, I wouldn't know. My son knows about a library, not because I'm a librarian, because that's where we took him. <laughs> you know, you go to the playground, you went to the library. It's important. And the older I get, I bring strange stranger kids, like neighbors, and I just like come to the library with us <laughs> because I think it's important. Because if you 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 get older and you're not around kids and you're like, that's fine, I don't have to go there anymore. But you have to introduce somebody else to it, or they won't go. The schools don't have libraries anymore, really. They have you know, computers, <laughs> even true. in school, they That's don't true. have a place where a kid can pick up a book or there's not an actual librarian. There might be a, you know, student teacher or a technician, but there's not a librarian with those children in the school. And so what you think, the experience you think they're having, they're not having, but since you're sitting here, you know about a library. So bring somebody <laughs> in with you. I'm, I'm glad you're saying it because one of the things um, for me um, with the mission of, of Arlick is that we want to fill the gap. So they're not teaching children about um, African American studies and like a, a full, richer history of how this country was founded, how their ancestors arrived here. Um, this is the space in which you supplement um, that that education. And so, yeah. I was that. fortunate when I was uh, in a small town in South Carolina, we could not go to the public library. Public libraries closed to us. As black people. To black people, that's right. But my mother though felt that we needed it and she would buy an encyclopedia, she'd go find, you could buy um, wherever they were, were, were weeding out the, the old ones. And she'd bring it home and she, she would say to me, Julianne, you can use this book to get your, your assignments. And I said, well, that may not be what I need. She said, well, create it. Mm -hmm. So she was really my support and how I got to information. But it's amazing. You feel lost and out of touch if you don't have information. There is a thirst that everyone ought to have for information. We ought to be able, like for children, we ought to be able to make certain that every child has an access to information. I think Sam may have said, information is powerful. I know Easty used to say this to me all the time. Information is so powerful that if you are without it, you're lost in society. And so for us, we need to make certain that our children have a chance at information and to make them powerful. Yeah, I just want to add to that. I love you also. So <laughs> I'm like, can you be my mom? I just, it's like, <laughs> just everyone here feels that right now. Uh, I was talking to a colleague a couple of days ago. She studies cybersecurity and InfoSec. And um, she was reminding me that, you know, our kids get TikTok, right? They get these kinds of, and all of you out here on TikTok, I'm not making specific eye contact at you right now when I say this, so don't feel any particular way, but I will say that one of the things we know, for example, about TikTok, which is a Chinese uh, social media company, is that uh, in China, when you watch TikTok, for their young people, you probably know this, after an hour of scrolling TikTok, it, the algorithm will convert to um, showing you science, technology, engineering, math, STEM, TikTok um, videos. Did you know this? Mm -hmm. Yes, because in China, they know that TikTok is incredibly addictive and they use TikTok to educate the public after they've had a little bit of fun. But when that same software, social media is exported to the United States, it's used as a type of, 
you know, I'm, I'm sorry to say it's used as a type of kind of psychological warfare um, to dumb down our kids, right? So, and ourselves, I'm not gonna just put it on the kids and ourselves who are, um, because all the Gen Xers are on TikTok doing dances. So I just wanna offer that, you know, we think also that because we have the smartphone, we're smarter, but that is also a misnomer. And in many of the ways that we have other industries and other, you know, um, analogous things we can look to, like uh, you don't see fast food in Beverly Hills. Not a lot of fast food joints in Beverly Hills. I know I live in LA, okay? All over South Central LA though, okay? And which is where I live. So um, the slow food movement the organic food movement, the farm to table food movement is for middle class and affluent and rich people. The idea of slowing down and having dinner, I know this is not gonna make sense to you um, because there are, uh, you know, our, our, the generations before us would have it no other way that we sit down and make a meal and we know what's in it and we can eat it together and we take our time, we build community around it. Um, my generation grew up on the, you know, the fast food overwhelm of our neighborhoods and our communities. And now having healthy food is a luxury item. And what we know about the internet is that people who are in power, who make these technologies, they don't let their own children use them. They have the nanny agreements, they keep them off. So these are the, I say all this to say, the library, if we were to conceptualize it today and say, we're gonna put buildings around, we're gonna buy a bunch of books collectively, we're gonna pull our resources together, we're gonna use tax paper, payer dollars to do it. I mean, right out of the gate, these would be banned. These would be marked as communist organizations that there is no way in the world. I mean, if you think about, I, I, I can hear Ted Cruz right now in my ear talking about what the library is if it were invented today. So I want us to be smart thinkers about what we will lose if we lose it. And we have to keep the pressure on our city councils and on our states to keep the funding for libraries intact because the alternatives are slim and they are not, I mean, we know that they work as a very important supplement to your point to public education, which is also incredibly under threat. So um, let's think in the ecosystem of where we are. Question. Hi, thank you ladies for being here. I've learned so much. This has been amazing. Um, can you share what you feel has been some of the greatest accomplishments in Black librarianship in your own opinions? We're thinking because it's been so much. Well, I will say this place. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. For sure. absolutely. We were the, yes. the place that we're sitting in. Um, I had the yeah. distinct honor of, of working at the Schomburg Center research in black culture before I arrived here. So I think about all of the labor, the invisible labor that went into the work of librarians in that, those spaces who were very, even though they were working in the past, they were thinking about me in the future. And so um, just the establishment. So talking about digging up the traces of the past and, and finding evidence of your history um, that kind of work of recovery um, to where I can at least go back to some archives and see myself um, reflected in those spaces. Um, those are some great accomplishments yeah. that I'm happy for. And I think similarly, I would say uh, the Black Caucus of the American Library Association, which is one of the five ethnic caucuses. Uh, they're now called the National Association of Librarians of Color. Um, so this is happening, you know, across the board. Um, they are 50 years old now, um, and they've done so much, I think, for the profession, but also to kind of uh, unify those of us in the profession that often have been isolated or, you know, maybe we're the only one in an organization or maybe one of two. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is uh, the Spectrum Initiative out of the American Library Association. They're, over 20 years old now, um, and this, uh, these are scholarships for students of color to enter uh, graduate library and information science programs. And 
Um, I am actually a Spectrum doctoral fellow. They brought in some some doctoral students as well. Um, and so, you know, like we said, there's always more work to be done. Um, but I think that these are some of the stalwarts if you will, of, of black librarianship and just really uh, hallmarks and things that we can reference and hopefully keep a hold of uh, to keep strengthening black librarianship. Yeah, I think the carving out of African American libraries has been so important in universities um, in tandem with the, you know, the rise of black studies. The Black Studies libraries and African American Studies libraries are so incredibly important because without that carve out that was done by Black librarians, we would not be fairly represented. And in fact, those disciplines probably would languish without the librarians creating and curating and collecting the knowledge such to help help us understand that there are fields of study for black people that other people can learn from too, not just for black people. And th those are incredibly important. And those are also precarious in all of our US universities. So they're important spaces for students to be protecting too. Yeah, I mean, I think for every recommendation I give, every resume I read, every person that I hire of color that you've taught, that you have dropped some knowledge with, I feel is a, a way forward. I mean, we, we continuously give back. If I can get another person to complete a master's in library science or information science and work in the field, I feel like we've done it. <laughs> um, I think, I think um, not just the repositories, but I've worked in predominant repositories. And so me being able to bring in collections and teaching my staff to bring in collections um, is important. I think working with the community is a huge accomplishment. You know, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, we weren't talking to churches, we weren't talking to neighborhoods and asking for materials and saying this is worthy of being in an archive. You know, I always tell people my biggest fear is that, you know, there's computers underneath some basement from all the 90s because nobody knew what to do with them. You know, we've had all these accomplishments in the 80s but those people are still living. And if they've moved one too many times, their records are gone. I think about the photographs that are on our phones that we haven't printed out and I'm guilty. You know, I have a baby book from one to three and everything else is on my phone. So where do we, you know, my goal is to be on panels like this, but also to hire, to encourage people to be part of the profession, to encourage you to support us in the profession so that we continue this cycle and not go down the ticket talk road because or I'm with you I'm on just all here to scare people tonight <laughs> well you did it I've I mean, done it my job did. it's funny because it's something I, I I tell people all the time you know people are always fascinated my son is not on any social media but that's my choice he's yeah. made that choice yeah. you know and the fact that he can still pick up a book I couldn't be prouder but now it's how do we get other kids to do the same yes. you know how is it to get them to you know know their history and understand it how to sit at the table and actually have a meal you know things like that I think are important to kind of get back to Dr. Ramon? Yes, we have um, two Spectrum scholars online, on, and one is from 2016, one Hello. is from 2012. And one of them is asking, how do you handle or combat the day-to-day -day personal challenges of being a Black female librarian? Lots of prayer. <laughs> I think we have support systems. And I think you have to know when to pull back and take a vacation. <laughs> I mean, it, it can be quite exhausting. And I think you have, you, you're not by yourself. And I think there's no shame in seeing a therapist or a minister or whatever you need to have that conversation because it is daunting. This is, my last few jobs is the first time my staff insist on calling me Dr. Evans. And I never understood it until people would say things like, I wanna to speak to her. And the person would be like, who? I wanna to speak to her. And she was like, who? Her. And they would refuse to say my name. And I didn't understand that until I had a couple of these situations and I thought, when will this end? You know, why is that such a big deal? So to me, it's about keeping our mental health well as we do this work, keeping our spiritual life well to do this work and having a group of people that we, that support us so that we can decompress. You know, it's, it's hard to do this work and then realize you need a break. 
and and be okay with taking the break because sometimes you, you I feel guilty. I took a break, <laughs> you know, and I feel bad. And I have to realize that in order for me to keep going and keep bringing people in and bringing the collections in, I have to care for me as well. Yeah. Um, I 100% co-sign uh, with what Meredith said. I tell my students um, to, you know, be ready to take breaks um, and, you know, find your people, find your network. I have a group of uh, my sister scholars that I talk to almost daily, um, you know, because you have to have someone that you can say, can you believe what this person said to me? <laughs> right. And that you don't have to explain what what that's about. You're keeping it very classy. Yes, I am. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I also, you know, I do also tell them to pick their battles. Um, we can't pick every bet. Listen, we, we'd all be laid out on the floor if we picked every battle that came to us every day. Um, but I, I also think that there is some value in picking battles. I mean, I, I do think, and I think, you know, we are in higher ed, which is its own beast. Um, and, you know, I think there is some credence to the idea of you have to teach people how to treat you. So if you, if Dr. Evans does not say, I'm sorry, my name is Dr. Evans, they will continue to say her. Right. I have been in I've been in spaces where, you know, someone has handed me plates because they thought I was the wait staff or have asked me if I was housekeeping, because why else would this black woman be walking around this college? And this is not to disparage my brothers and sisters who do this work. But the perception is, is that that's all we do. Um, so, yeah, I think picking battles in addition to self-care um, is, is very important. I think we need a spa for to retreat from white supremacy um, on the regular. I feel like I could make a lot of money doing that in my next life. Um, I, you know, we, we have to set boundaries. It's not just in librarianship. It's really all of us in every line of work that we are doing. We need to have healthy boundaries. For me, I recently left. Um, the core department, uh, you know, the information studies department, which is the library and information science department at UCLA, where I've spent the last eight years of my career, um, because it just was like, I'm not gonna really deal with like being the things I'm dealing with here. And I moved my faculty line to gender studies and African American studies. And I te still teach those students who are interested in working with me. But now they get to have those conversations in a black studies classroom or in a gender studies classroom, which is um, great and a, and a good time. And it's healthy. And um, we are I'm able to be more free to be me in those spaces. So I think the freedom to be ourselves while we are still integrating any field that we're working on, because most of us probably in this room are one of a handful of black people where we work. We also get to set the terms of engagement around that work. And we don't have to just be there to be the token person. I was the first black person in the history of my department um, in LIS at UCLA to be tenured. The first person in the history of UCLA. This is like ludicrous. Um, and once I, you know, had the freedom of job security and tenure, I also realized, like, whoa, I also have the intellectual freedom to set a boundary and say, maybe I can't come every day and sit in this office um, with like these antagonisms. I can you know, get get some love somewhere else. I mean, in the gender studies and the African American studies meetings, you already know what those faculty meetings are like. It's like, girl, I need them shoes. What are we doing? What's what's good? What's happening? You know, there's just a different kind of freedom. And I think we all deserve to be free in our excellence. Because the black excellence can, does not have to come at the expense of, of our well being of our health of coming home and being, you know, nasty with our partners and our kids because we're just trying to shake it off. So those are really important things for everybody. I wish that someone had given me permission to love myself when I was a much younger woman. And I hope that for the young person um, asking the question that you will unapologetically love yourself and have boundaries. It doesn't mean we don't have to come into contact with racism and sexism and homophobia and all the things, 
but it does mean that we can um, not sacrifice ourselves to it. All right, we ha we can't be excellent if we are just, um, you know. What, what am I even talking about when you're here? I mean, <laughs> you have job all the lessons. The is undaunting anyhow. It is. And what I find is that those who are in higher ops did not understand that you needed additional staff to get the work done because, and there were boxes and boxes of, of special collections that sit there for not just a few months, but years. Right. And when that information is in a box, it has no essence for your, your public that walks in. Yes. And so that to me is so ludicrous. Yes. It, 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 it's just that, as I say all the time, information is powerful. And you've got to understand to get that information process takes staff. It does not take one person. One person will burn out. So it is right. You do have to go back and, and take care of yourself, but you have to also fight for additional staff. That's right. But you got to get to the right. top. That's right. You got to get to the top. Yes. There's a handful of us yes. that have the ability to open those boxes yes. that people didn't want to open before. So I need people to keep going. Yeah. Once you come into the freshman, I you know take a break if you want, but I need you to keep going yes. to Absolutely. get to the top. Because if Makiba and I weren't here, we can name them. We got a handful. Yeah, we, I mean, we can't open the box. And yeah. so even for that, like you can't open the building like it, it, without Sam's vision and really pushing for this place to be open. We would be a small little branch library, but he had vision, but he was also at the top. So that means for us to also to continue to keep striving. Dr. Acosta. Hello, I believe this sister was next. Oh, so I'm okay. let her go I was going next. back and forth on, in, in oh. the room. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Great dialogue tonight. I was wondering if you could share about any work you're doing or any work that you know that's going on that's looking to help us think about and frame and understand library studies diasporically, right? As a way for us to return library and knowledge to its divine purposes, right? Because library didn't start in America. The white folks started with us. <laughs> and so what we see now is the, the degradation of a divine way of thinking about knowledge and expressing knowledge and valuing knowledge. What are we doing? That is a fabulous question. I love it. I love it. I, and I, I, there need to be dissertations on this. Um, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Anna Ndumu. She's at the University of Maryland. I'm, I'm <laughs> and she is, this is not exactly her area, but she's the closest that I can think of off the top of my head about um, who is looking at uh, black librarianship across the diaspora. Um, so I would uh, recommend her and also uh, I would also send you back to the Black Caucus of the American Library Association because mm -hmm. um, I know she's doing some work with them as well. There is uh, the International Federation of Library Associations. Uh, it's IFLA for short. And that's where we get into global and international librarianship. So while I can't name names for you, um, there are black librarians that are outside of the US uh, that would belong to IFLA and might possibly be doing some of this work. Yes, and archivists and people are working on like things like repatriation of knowledge and artifacts back to their countries of origin and peoples of or uh, the kind of um, indigenous peoples um, around the world. And these are, again, political struggles. Yeah. Um, so thanks for your gorgeous. Comments. Um, so I, I think there are there are organizations uh, in our field that are working on these things and we be in touch with us and we can help guide you. Um, you know, the other thing is, I think always librarianship and, and archives are in tension with, you know, pan Africanist yeah. ways of thinking about knowledge. So it's it's hard, I think, sometimes for me, even as a scholar, as a black studies scholar, to separate librarians and archivists from 
um, other kinds of knowledge producers because we are reliant upon libraries and archives in order to make knowledge, right? And to keep that kind of divine, um, as you um, phrased it, connection to the project yeah. of um, human connection over time, over centuries, yeah. right? Over millennia, which is really part of the, the ultimate to me project of librarianship that we're talking about here is how do we capture, collect, save, the best parts of our humanity, learn from the things that we um, must learn from in order to create more possibilities for human beings and for black people specifically in this context. And that project is, you know, it's symbiotic. There are many different kinds of people mm -hmm. touching that, mm -hmm. but that, um, that impulse that you are describing that is, calling you right that you are compelled um, by is a very very important one and so even if there isn't one particular person i mean like many histories of ours we don't know the names of our ancestors in this space but we know that this spirit and this tradition is very powerful and and i hear you articulating it and i hope that you will be um this future with us that we're creating i see it I Go know. ahead and claim it. I see it and I see you. And I, can we and just, I, I'm sorry, I just want to repeat what you said so we can marinate on that. You said the repatriation of knowledge. Can we just feast on that? Like, feast on that. That's the return. Of, go ahead. Sanko. Yeah. <laughs> So I just wanted to add um, a name, Dorothy Porter Wesley. Uh, um, I think um, some of her work was also within this tradition that you're sort of talking about um, throughout the diaspora. I know she did some work in Nigeria um, with libraries. Um, she's very important in terms of, of, of creating um, how we describe records that um, reflect a, a true identity of blackness and things like that. So I think within that tradition, Dorothy Porter Wesley um, will be important. I'm, I'm trying to think, did, did Irene Owens do some stuff in, in Africa? I believe she did. Yeah. Okay. And she's still with us, right? That's one I of your mentors. Say, Irene Owens' work is, and she's still with us. I saw her last weekend. Um, she's the second black PhD at Chapel Hill. I'm the third. So, um, her, I would say the Society of American Archivists, there is a round table um, that focuses on this. Um, we have mosaic scholarships too for people of color to kind of bring them in. And there's a connection through IFLA and through um, the Canadian Archival Association where we are doing some global work as well. So there's a connection um, there. And there's people, I would say participatory archiving and community archiving is really important because it is stretching beyond um, a neighborhood and a state and a city, it's, it's going global. There's that global relationship. And having been in St. Louis when Michael Brown was killed and, and watching the, the protests in Ferguson, that Twitter feed was global. Um, the lessons learned um, about organizing protests in that way was really through Twitter and people from Arab Spring were, were in correspondence with the activists in Ferguson. So that that's documented mm -hmm. um, in the Doc Now tool. There's things that are out there showing that connection and, and people are knowing, know, know that that global connection is important and that history um, from which we came that some of us don't know, right? Or can even remember because it was not really taught, right? Um, is there. Dr. Hankerson. Yes. Good afternoon, ladies. It's my pleasure meeting all of you. Uh, as an economist who comes to the table, and one as an econometrician and also a Clark Atlanta University, but Atlanta University graduate who met Lorraine and her husband, Paul, so I know them well. But one of the things um, in terms of collection of data that has been um, one thing that I enjoy very much, but one thing that has not happened, and I'm going to say to the full extent that it needs to in Broward County, is that we have to be concerned about the land. Black land matters. Where is it once we collect this data when the library gets full and we have nowhere to go? We have great organizations that have catered to us in the past, like the Black Elks around the world and those places we are losing because we have not transitioned into collecting the kind of data 
that we need to collect from our people in our churches that we are losing, which is black land, that are being taken from us through gentrification, through annexing, through all kinds of sources in terms of the, the name of economic advancement. But we've got to have a place to put these. So we need people who are librarian, archivists, because people who often collect data are not ones who understand how to preserve data. And so we have to begin to work together to find these spaces when the library is no longer open and those places, some folks don't come to the library, but they go to other locations, they go to church. So we can have a collection there that we can display. They go to the else because they can have a place to display. They can go to some of our other not-for-profit or for-profit entities who have business like the Dickey Consulting Services that provides a space for us to do the cultural archiving. Those places can begin, we have to support those in our black community, transition them that we have a space that we can begin putting that information and our people can begin trusting us to have access to what it is, because the biggest problem is, is that oftentimes they don't trust it. So if we began to look at other areas that the library can work with to help expand those things, and then we're just talking about in the state of Florida alone, they have 28 or 27 lodges and temples. If we clean them up, we put collections in them and other organizations that we have, then now we've got full collections of putting people who we grow in the library business that don't have to depend on institutional work in order to make it happen. Now you create an engine or economic base for growth. So I'm saying, ladies, let's look towards that economic engine that can go far beyond just the library, but that can reach out to those tentacles within the community and understand that we have to save that land to build that database so that we move along, that that AI works for us in the long run. Thank you. Ashe. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Hi, my name is Opal Comfort. I am a journalist by trade, but um, I met Jared Lanier, I don't know if you know that name, when he was 15 years old in New Mexico. He's now 50 something, so that dates me. But he's in, uh, he is the father of virtual reality and you touched on this subject earlier. It's very dangerous what's going on and you, you mentioned that the algorithms how we've been racially profiled and how we are uh, brainwashed to do various things and so on and so forth through social media. But what's not addressed is what do we do about this? What do we do? Because it's happening. It's happening. I worked at a university in HBCU before um, I started my own business recently, but what I'm saying is they can't even look up to say good morning anymore. It is serious business. And yes, we're being surveilled all the time. We're being, I mean, he says it. If you do watch Netflix and you haven't read the book, Jared, who is a sweetie pie, unfortunately, he invented this. He said, I had no idea this thing was going to be so dangerous. It is very dangerous what's happening to our children and to us. And but no one is saying what to do about it. Even he doesn't know what to do about it. He's tried to talk to Google and to this one and to that one to say, you know, this is this is bad. But they're making so much money, they don't care. It's about greed. So don't want to go on and on. I just want to say, what are we going to do? Because we, we are aware. We are aware. But yet, what are we doing? If I may, um, I know Jaron's work well. And uh, he was he's one of the 
main figures in a film called The Social Dilemma, if you have seen it, um, uh, which is a film that features a number of white men from Silicon Valley who've invented technologies or led tech companies or been in leadership in tech companies and um, are now like, oops, we didn't, we didn't know. And, um, and it's true, they don't have a lot of ideas for how to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, there are also other projects um, that are being led by people of color around the world them and organizations who do know what to do so one of the things we see, for example, is in. Um, Detroit has been one of the leading cities in the United States to um, organize to do things like ban facial recognition ban surveillance cameras in black communities and neighborhoods. Um, uh, in Los Angeles. Angeles, where I live, the um, Stop LAPD Spying Coalition has been one of the most powerful voices for stopping the use of predictive policing technologies and predictive surveillance technologies, again, on Black and um, Latinx communities, poor people, because one, one thing we know is that many of these technologies are um, experimented or kind of beta tested on Black and Latinx um, communities, poor people, especially in LA, uh, these technologies were beta tested on Skid Row, which is all people experiencing homelessness who have no agency in speaking back. And yet they were able to organize and watch and see the way in which these different kinds of technologies were being pointed at them and then working with grassroots organizations to document that. And in LA, we've been very successful in pushing back on predictive policing technologies, for example. So I actually think there's a lot more hope than the great men of Silicon Valley would narrate who do feel more hopeless than someone like me, because I think, you know, we come from traditions of resistance. I mean, my grandmother was born into sharecropping. Um, my grandfather, my dad tells me was sold when he was five years old from the Gullah Islands to a, a white man in Philadelphia. And, you know, these histories that we all have in our families of resisting and overcoming are the power. That's actually, that's what we do. That is what we do. That's our, our superpower. That's our technology is resistance. So I think we just stay um, attuned to what's happening. Much of the power is happening. Broward County, I mean, my husband was like, I cannot believe you're going to Florida. I was like, I got to go because my people get, can't be locked out because of what the governor's doing. We got to still have these conversations and be together and love on each other. And so here Thank we you are. For okay. But, you know, this is a county that all over the country we are talking about in terms of predictive technologies being racially discriminatory and them having been tested out here. So you're already in the leadership of being able to articulate what these harms have been. And I think um, that power, you know, Pasco County, Florida, where the sheriff's office was using a predictive software where they were asking the school district to give over all the school records. You know what I'm talking about, the Pasco County Coalition has been so powerful in pushing back and saying, no way, now the Sheriff's Department's being sued for getting all of our children's school records and feeding it into some snake oil software to try to predict who would be future criminals, harassing our children to the point of self-harm. So our power, is the technology of resistance. That is what we have. And that is partly what we, the library, here we are. You are enabling us to have this powerful conversation. That's what I think is part of, you know, what we're dealing with. And we have, you know, um, we our co communities have been under attack since we were brought to these lands, North America, South America, the Caribbean. Um, and even on the continent. So I think we should not feel hopeless because we're still here. Yes. We are still here. We're doing what we're doing. And, you know, I will just say my, my, my heart response for you is that 
Um, I ground my work in abolition, in abolitionist theory. I think of myself as a technology abolitionist, not because I don't use technology and love some parts of technology, but because I know that it has always been a handful of people who were the Harriet Tubmans, who were the people who did the work, who narrated the social change, who organized and networked people to freedom. It has always been a handful of abolitionists who rejected the carceral state, who said, we are not gonna live under these terms. It wasn't millions of people who got on board and organized that. It was a handful of people. So we should think our, of ourselves, this is the abolition meeting we had tonight, yeah. you know, and we got our thoughts together and we're gonna have some strategies for people who live here in this community. There's a jumping off point for more and we stay and, and to build with people who are already building and resisting here. That to me and the library and the work that all of you are doing is so important because then it's like, um, you know, I had a professor once say to me, he said, well, you know, Safia, the reason why you get the education, you know what you're doing here is because whenever, when someone turns to you and says, okay, what do we do? <laughs> you're not stuck. So this is what the librarians are here for, because when we're like, what do we need to do? We are not stuck because we have Makeba here, <laughs> Makeba to help us get it right. So this is what I'm saying and all these beautiful librarians here is that we have to just figure out what our role is mm -hmm. in it. There will always be new inventions and new um, projects of occupation mm -hmm. and colonization and enslavement, and they are making them more and more fun and interesting and addictive. But um, we are not, this is not a totalizing experience. This does not have to be what it is. In fact, many people are resisting around the world globally by not using these technologies, by opting out. There might be a way we would narrate the digital divide as an asset mm. at some point. So we just have to, we have to not be in the deficit model. Yeah. We have to think differently like, okay, well, if our people aren't on all these computers and they don't have a smartphone, maybe that will also be powerful at some point. Mm -hmm. Maybe we will have the books that we will pass around. Mm -hmm. You know, the, so I just think there's many ways of thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't wanna leave this meeting unaccountable for my own words tonight. I say these things not to scare you. I'm no fun at a cocktail party, obviously, <laughs> but I say these things so that we can find the creative juice that we already know. Mm -hmm. We already know we're gonna out slick it and outsmart it, yeah. but we can't if we don't know. And yeah. so that's the power. Just to give you a, a quick Thank local you. example of what Dr. Noble just described, uh, Follett, which is one of our uh, companies that provides library software, they were going to institute this policy that school librarians had to opt, or they couldn't opt out of, that was going to allow parents to access the checkout records of their children in school libraries. Now, in this day and age, that could be incredibly dangerous. So with that said, the school librarians, I don't know if you all follow library Twitter, it's a lot, y'all. Um, but library Twitter shut that down inside of a week. Inside of a week. Because, you know, if we're talking about capitalism, these librarians said, well, here's, here's the company that I'm moving to if you do this, right? So whatever the rationale is, Follett said, hey, y'all, we're, we were joking. Um, we're not gonna do it. Not bad. Shut it down inside of a week. So that is a, a, a concrete local library example of what Dr. Noble just um, mentioned, this type of mobilization and saying, we do have power and we know how to yield it. So we're gonna have one more question because we want you to be able to get your book signed by Dr. Noble. Um, Michelle? Hello, everyone. Um, my question is for Dr. Noble, but anyone else can answer it. It's about Google Scholar. And um, when you said Google and you said the algorithm, I was like, oh gosh. I use Google Scholar a lot <laughs> to get my articles. Um, and if I can't get it, if I can't download it, I go to my library login and I download it. So what are your thoughts about Google Scholar? Because as a PhD student, I want to make sure that I'm getting the right source and, and, and I'm being directed in the right way. Yeah. So just I'll what are your thoughts? I'll give you a super, super fast answer on yeah. Google Scholar. Mm -hmm. Not enough. It's not enough. Okay. It's a very thin layer 
um, Google only indexes about 45% of the open web. And it mostly focuses on Google Scholar on the large publishing companies, as Dr. Cook mentioned. So journals that are, um, you know, uh, in large kind of scholarly publishing bundles and collections, which typically librarians are being forced more and more to purchase. Um, those are going to be the things that show up the most because Google's entered into these contracts with large scholarly publishing publishers. Um, so that means that for us, what we know is that black scholars, especially in black studies, we are often publishing in black studies journals that are not owned by Elsevier or some, you know, big publisher, which means they might not show up all the time in something like Google Scholar. So, you know, it's a, it, remember that Google is an advertising company always, and it's, it's foregrounding those that op pay it the most to optimize their content. That means if we have like a local kind of community-based archive, it's not gonna be indexed probably in Google Scholar. So this always will work to the detriment of minoritized communities and under-resourced communities who are not kind of in this massive commercial publishing space. That's the thing to remember. Now, look, you gotta go in and get something because you need a PDF of something and probably somebody like Dr. Cook has put the PDF on somewhere in a, a open source like a repository so that you don't have to get behind the paywall to get to it. Those kinds of things Google Scholar can be helpful to you for because it will quickly help you get to it. But we don't wanna think of it as indexing all of the world's knowledge by any stretch. And, and you know, be thoughtful and careful, especially as a PhD student, that you don't have these kind of thin lit reviews that um, the expertise of a librarian can help you with, most certainly. All right, so I think we're gonna wrap up this evening. Oh, oh I'm sorry, go ahead. Very quick question. Come on, I didn't see you down there. No, no, come on. So uh, brief responses, because we wanna get you out there to sure. be able to meet and greet in time both. Uh, but first of all, I do want to say thank uh, Arlick for sponsoring this great event. Uh, this is an epic event, and I don't want to overemphasize epic, but to uh, join these two sciences together, uh, the information science and the data science is really pivotal at this point. So thank you. Uh, this is really an historic night. Um, We've all talked about and talked around this about uh, how the library uses data. And as Dr. Noble talks about data being a very different sort of entity, um, what are some of the uh, ways that the library now will begin to resource itself? Uh, we say it's data driven but data driven requires some other data resources. And so where are we in terms of that in moving our community? And secondly, uh, I know you said be brief, but secondly, <laughs> because you say at the data collection, data collections re require data collectors and data managers. And so how can we integrate people from other disciplines who don't see themselves as librarians but very much embrace this idea that we need to collect and maintain and understand our data from a holistic view. I will say in the archive world, not many of us are librarians. Most, most archivists are historians or, you know, English majors, or it's a variety, usually heavily humanities based. Um, the MLS just gets us a professional job, right? Um, so for in the archival world, because we're still very tactile, um, we seek funding. You know, most of my job is spent finding funding <laughs> to support so that stuff doesn't stay in a box. Um, and, be, and being, you know, particular about what donor I actually accept money for, right? And make sure that I'm negotiating in a way where that donor doesn't control what happens in my shop. So I think, you know, I think there's a variety of ways we all do our work, um, but, but getting the funding is, is constant. I think that's the number one question I get asked. 
you know, Dr. Evans, how do you fundraise so well? How, what do you do? What do I need to know? How, help me understand a budget. Help me understand how to approach people. And I think when you get that part going, then your powers that be actually start giving you more money as well. So I think you really have to come up with good, valuable arguments for what it is. Um, and then as we grow with our sort of past paper to digitizing stuff to born digital content, now we're at a point in archives where we have to do everything at the same time. We don't have time to do something systematically and go back to the audio tapes or go back to the boxes all the time because we have digital stuff in real time. You know, people talk to me all the time about I'm scanning things and I'm thinking, what are you scanning? Because that's a copy. The original's on the server. So until we've mastered taking data off the server that we are gonna figure out how to keep those X's and O's for the next 50 years, you know, that's the decision making we're making. And that's also how we're getting funding. Because people realize my X's and O's, that paper that I, you know, if I didn't print it out, might not be here, right? And that's so the art, you know, funding is important, but you got to seek it and you got to be careful who you take it from. Anyone else? Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good for you. <sighs> yeah. Oh, wait, yeah. Um, how to the question was how do you get other sort of resources in I think as uh, Mr. Busty was asking this question because he's all about data he's been doing some really good work in the community around elections and where does that data go and come from I'm surprised you didn't ask a question about that but um okay <laughs> so you should have come up early and asked this question I, one of the things that I just thought about was uh, the idea of so participatory archives and community-based archives. So for me, it is not about actually being degreed and, and having these formal kind of trainings. It's the role of libraries to actually go out and help folks um, to organize and collect their own information. And then there's an opportunity in which we, we collaborate. Um, there's a lot of work that's happening around this idea of post-custodial kind of work where we're not trying to take everything thing from people in the community but we're there as an aid a resource to help them and so um in those kind of relationship community building um that there is this sort of resource sharing that happens so that's my thought and let me say this you you're responsible for making sure your government keeps data i don't care if it's the city level state level country level if you don't hold your government responsible for the data that they collect, because they take everything from you, right? I mean, your life is an open book in many ways. So as a citizen, ask for the data and make them take care of it, right? I mean, that's part of our civic responsibility. So if we're going to vote, you know, great. If we're not voting, that's a problem, because if you're not voting, you're not on a jury. But they have all your information, and you should know the information that they have on you. So you need to vote and you need to be involved and you need to hold your representative accountable for the data that they're making decisions on to change your street lights, to change when they decide they're going to pave a road, to change when they're going to allow, you know, $10 billion condos to take over the school park, right? You have to be engaged and you have to hold your citizen, you know, your representatives accountable. And that's all part of archiving, honestly. You know, you assume the archivist has it, but we pull whatever's from the city, the county, the state. That's what we get it. So if it's if we don't if you as voters don't hold them accountable, we don't we, we get nothing. Right. And you, and you have to have information literacy, media literacy, civic literacy, all of the literacies to do yep. just that. To do just that. So so thank was it a, one more question? I just want, I wanted to say one thing um, with regards to the abolitionist piece that you talked about, um, the coded bias on Netflix. I think it's important if you haven't seen that because I know you're in it, aren't you? I thought, yeah, it's it's important. It's an educational and it kind of speaks to, you know, what we're talking about in terms of what other options exist, you know, and what other coded yeah. bias. The film is called Coded Bias. Uh, yeah, it is definitely one of the things that's interesting is it follows the story of a young researcher who, uh, Joy Bolomini, uh from MIT, who's now Dr. Bolomini, um, as she works on helping people understand the gender discrimination in facial recognition. But I think one of the most important stories in that was the story of the moms, the black women 
in New York who really led the charge um, when facial recognition was implemented in their um, housing, um, in their in their low income housing uh, building, and um, you had to be scanned for facial recognition to come in and out of the building, which of course precluded them from having friends over and family over. And the technology fails the most on Black women's faces, which was Joy's um, canonical research. And so in a study called Gender Shades. So this film is interesting. Um, I mean, there it has limits, but it, it certainly is a narrative that helps us understand um, that where the expertise is when we think about resistance and we think about the expertise is with us because we're where it's touching we it's touching us our kids our communities our families we know when the zoom school was going down last year and the proctoring um software to tell your kids they could take the test didn't see the black kids faces right we're the people who have the knowledge and that is a lot of power too so just re remember that so, no power to the people so yeah. we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna close out i want to thank you all you all have been a wonderful audience give yourself a round of applause thank you to our wonderful panelists thank you to you all who are viewing from online on zoom thank you for being with us and so we will ask you to exit if you would like to have your book signed um, please go out and get into the queue um, so the book can be signed. We are, please be brief, no long conversations with Dr. Noble or Dr. Cook because my staff want to get a little bit of rest so they can go home because we went a little bit longer than we intended. So, but I thank you so very much. I want to thank our sponsors again, um, Alvin Sherman Library, uh, BBX Capital Foundation, Broward Public Library Foundation, Ryder Dickey Consulting, who else am I forgetting? EBSCO. I think that is everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us and look for our next event on April 30th. It is our Art of Community Festival. Thank you so much. Pleasure to meet you.